Thank you very much. And Frank, what a wonderful presentation. Amen? Yeah, that was wonderful. And uh, what a joy to serve the Lord together. Well, a few weeks or months, I don't remember how long ago it was, someone asked about the tattoos, which was uh, on the tail end of, I don't remember what, pork eating and Sabbath keeping or something. I don't remember what it was. But we didn't get to it, so I thought we would save it for tonight. Uh, the question is, does God's Word guide us about having tattoos? And as you turn somewhere in your Bibles, let's go to Deuteronomy 29.29. 29. And as you turn there, I want to explain to you what we're talking about. We're not talking about uh, guide you if you have one tonight. This is not, you know, go down and get your tattoo lasered off night. Um, it's not about uh, uh, us undoing things we've done. What it's about is from this moment forward, before making any further decisions on modifying our body, making sure that we have all the facts, not from the culture, not to make sure we don't have a, you know, a hepatitis needle or an AIDS needle, you know, that's being reused in the process, but whether or not that or anything we do pleases the Lord. See, that's really what it comes down to. The Apostle Paul distilled down in the New Testament what I'm going to show you here in the Old Testament, and to these people, immersed in a pagan culture, once they got saved, they took one step back and they said, well, everybody around us does this, and I've always done that in the past, but will this please God? That was 1 Thessalonians 4.1. I taught you how you ought to please God. Deuteronomy 29.29 29 is interesting. We always hear the first part of it. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. What that means is stuff that's not talked about in the Bible isn't for us to speculate about. And that would solve a lot of the contentions in Christendom. If it's not clearly taught in the Bible, if it's only inferential, if it's derived after, you know, if, if you have to have 17 lexicons and 12 theological books to defend the point, maybe you shouldn't defend it so hard. Uh, because it says the secret things belong to God. But look at the rest of the verse. But... Those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do, isn't this interesting, all the words of this law. Now remember law, and I hear a lot about law. In fact, I had a long conversation with someone about law, and I, I listened, and it was wonderful, but that word right there, law, Torah, primarily means the teachings of a teacher. And sometimes we... We almost think that Moses thought all this stuff up that we're looking at tonight. Actually, Moses was the conduit. Moses was merely the human instrument God used, God used to reveal his heart, his mind, his will. We must, we must never forget that the scriptures, it's not Paul thought that up, it's not Peter thought that up, it's not Moses thought that up. Every word of God is pure. This is not the word of Moses. This is not the word of Peter or Paul or anyone else. This is the word of God. And that, um, it's interesting, I was, I was speaking, I guess it was last week at Go Lake, and the director out there introduced me, and he said, he said, the reason we invite Pastor Burnett, who, who lives so close to Go Lake, is because he has a high view of Scripture. You know what a high view of Scripture means? that I believe what God's Word says. Now, other people might say it means something different, but the primary interpretation of the Word of God is what it says. Before you overlay it with, well, I'm not sure it, it means what it says. Well, before you overlay it with that, the, the first and primary thing we have to deal with is what it says. So, before I go on and on, does God's Word guide us about having tattoos? In other words, the first thing, if someone asked me this, the first thing I would do, in fact, the, the first thing I did is, uh, I looked up, is that word in the Bible? And let's just turn back to Leviticus 19, just to give you, and you knew I would go there, right? All of you says, oh, we knew he would go there, but it doesn't, uh, doesn't matter because we have an answer for anything in Leviticus. Okay. Glad. I'm glad to know your position. Uh, so I'll just state mine. I have a personal conviction against tattooing my body, not yours. 
I don't have any convictions about your body because I will not answer for your body. I will answer for your souls with the other elders if you are a part of the fellowship here and have associated long enough for us to know you and exert a spiritual watch care. Hebrews tells us that, that elders have to give an account for the souls of those that they shepherded. But I have convictions about my body. And I have a personal conviction against tattooing my body because of what God said in all of Leviticus 19, but especially in verse 28. Now, always be careful of ripping any, par any portion of the Word of God out of its context. Uh, anything that the Bible says is defensible, standing alone, as well as in the context for which we find it. If, if we have to you know, put up all kinds of barriers, and it's kind of like when they do surgery, you know how they cover you all up and they only leave that little place they're, they're cutting open, uh, you know, exposed. If, if that is how you have to treat, you know, something that's important to you from the Word of God, it might be a weak position. You understand what I mean? But if you can, not only if, if the little part that, that you got surrounded is supporting it, but then when you pull back all the context around it. If it still stands, then it's important. So let me just read the 28th verse. This is, and, and I bumped into this back my first time reading through the Bible when I was sitting in the library at Hazlitt, uh, first time all the way through the Bible, when I was in, I think, about the ninth grade, and Billy Graham sent me the living whatever uh, version or whatever portion of uh, Ken Taylor's Living Bible he was giving away for free. I wrote in for every one of them, and I read all of them. And I remember sitting there, and I bumped into this in the 28th verse. It says, you shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead. And I paused, and I thought, ooh, cuttings in your flesh for dead people. Um, and obviously, that's a pagan custom. And, and we see it all the way through the scriptures. We see uh, the, the uh, priests of Baal cutting themselves. And, and we see uh, other portions of the scripture where it talks about that. So I said, oh, um, the Lord doesn't like cuttings in your flesh for the dead. And by the way, necromancy in any form, anything to do with the dead, God is opposed to completely. God is very anti-occult. Horoscopes, Ouija boards, tarot cards, seances, palm readers, astrology having to do with foretelling the future. God is absolutely opposed to all of those things, and it's an abomination to him. But the verse doesn't end there. Nor tattoo any marks on you. Now, it would be interesting if the verse just stopped there, and if it was surrounded by, you know, don't boil a calf in its mother's milk, and put a parapet around your, your uh, rooftop, and don't eat any snails, you know, it'd be interesting if it was kind of in a collection of things like that, that we could say, oh, it's just Jewish ceremonial stuff. But look how it ends. Verse 28. It's, it's very interesting, the frequency of this little statement in the 19th chapter. I am the Lord. Look at verse 30 at the end. I am the Lord. Look at verse 31 at the end. I am the Lord. Verse 32 at the end. I am the Lord. Verse 34 at the end. I am the Lord, your God. Look at verse 37. I am the Lord. And you can back up before this verse. Verse 25. I am the Lord, your God. Boy, he's getting repetitive. What is he punctuating all this stuff for? If you notice, the 19th chapter of Leviticus and the 18th too is very unusual. It, it is a collection of truths. Now, let me just show you uh, how I think. Leviticus 19, 28, you should not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead. I mean, that's clear. Uh, I don't think any sane Christian would make cuttings in their body for dead people because they would know that God would probably be against that. And besides that, why would you want to do it? Uh, Nor tattoo any marks on you. And then Christians kind of say, wait a minute, that might be Old Testament stuff. We're not sure. But then when it has this little signature, I am the Lord, and by the way, the New King James, which is what this is, but the New American, the International, and the English Standard all contain the same translation of the underlying word tattoo. Okay, that's interesting. Now let's just look at the wider context because uh, if you look at, at Leviticus 19, this is a very, very important chapter that we wouldn't want to ditch too quick. 
I mean, the people that propound, oh, this is Jewish, and we're not Jews, or this is legalistic, and we're not under the law. It's very interesting the company this verse keeps. This verse has a restatement of respecting your parents in verse 3 about remembering the, sab- the Sabbath cycle of intimacy with God. Do you remember Jesus already defined the Ten Commandments? And he says that love fulfills all of the law. And each of the Ten Commandments in the New Testament is fulfilled. You say, but the Sabbath day is never mentioned. You're right, it's never mentioned because God never imposes the seventh day observance on the church. But what is there is love fulfilling it. And the Sabbath day is all about love. And the Sabbath day is God saying, I want you to stop the blur of your life and the accretion of your wealth and the the cycle of time in your life. And I want you to punctuate it and pause it because love demands intimacy. Love has to be nurtured and fed with intimacy. And God says, you cannot allow your life to just have unbroken stretches without pausing for intimacy with me. Now, the neat thing is that he doesn't tell us when to do that. He says, now, one of the good times to do it would be when my church gathers on the first day of the week to remember the resurrection of Christ from the dead. And the slave says, we want to do that, but we have to work all day. And so they came at night. But love demands intimacy, and there's a restatement of that Sabbath cycle. You can see it twice, forsaking any form of idolatry. I think we all would agree with that. Compassionate concern for the poor. I don't think we have any trouble with that. Maintaining honesty and integrity in business, we need a little more of that nowadays. Always protecting the mentally and physically challenged, we need that. Protecting justice and truth in speech, seeking to love our neighbor as ourself, combating greed, that whole thing about not cutting or not harvesting right away was a whole a whole setting in the land for the Israelites that was so much more about another rule for them. God says, when you come in to the land, I don't want you immediately harvesting. I want you to wait for a while. I want you to kind of get the lay of the land. I don't want you to get as much as you can as soon as you can. Just a very interesting thought, and I'm not on that. No one asked about that tonight. Uh, Avoiding paganism in any form, that's where we are tonight. That happens to be, you know, right in the middle of these wonderful statements. Always avoiding all occultism, magic, and witchcraft, verse 31. Promoting respect for the elderly. We need a little more for that, of that nowadays. Did you know we, we have a whole new generation that because we don't want to have God around and all these Judeo-Christian principles, I mean, they have no concept of respect. They don't even look at older people. In fact, they don't even look at adults. In fact, they don't look at anything except their little device. You know what I mean? It's just amazing how these principles are lost. This whole idea, uh, uh, I was just talking, I spoke to the counselors at the camp I just spoke at, and they said, you know, it's just amazing that the, the young people coming into our camping program, when we say, oh, ladies first, they go, what are you talking about? What's this ladies first stuff? You don't realize that ladies first comes from 1 Peter 3, that we're supposed to give honor unto women as unto the weaker vessel. Oh, they're not weaker. Egalitarianism. See how a culture robs itself of the blessings that God's word presents to it? But what's amazing is the church is robbed of it too. They said that the boys wouldn't think of stopping for the girls. Why? Why? There are no rules. There are no laws. These Old Testament things aren't for us. It's everyone for themselves. And, and see where we're going, we're eroding in our culture rapidly because of the, we've pulled out the control rods in every place of God. And the respect for the elderly is gone, protecting the loving treatment of aliens, the strangers. Um, no one asked me about that either. Honoring the character of God, reflecting in the whole law. And so notice the single reason given for all of these. Every one of these are punctuated with, I am the Lord your God. God says, you want to know why I do it? Because I'm the Lord your God. You want to know why? Because I'm the Lord your God. And, and God says, this is, now think about it. This is my character revealed. So, um, that's the context. Now, when we get to the New Testament, what's really interesting is the New Testament was completely nurtured from the Old Testament. The scriptures that Paul says, and that from a child you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation, was he talking about the Gospels? 
Was he talk, what was he talking about? He's talking about the Old Testament scriptures that Timothy was taught. See, the early church was preached to from the Old Testament. And they weren't told, watch out, it's dangerous stuff. They said, this is, this is the mind of God. This is in the New Covenant church. They used the Old Covenant as the illustrations. I mentioned that this morning. So in the, the New Covenant, most of all, we're told we are the temple of God. And God says much about the care of his temple. So my body became the, the dwelling place, the inhabitant, the place that God inhabits, the habitation of God. And so we start coming to principles that govern how to regulate this container for God. And the first is the, and, and by first, I'm just going through the order in the English Bible of these books, not even in the chronological order, and that would make it really interesting, but that would mix everybody up. So let's just go in the order there in the Bible. The principle of consecration. The first one is Romans 12, 1 and 2. God says, here's the principle. He says, you're to make sure that you are not getting squeezed into the world's shape. You say, I thought we were on tattoos. Yeah. I mean, read the secular description of world knowledge. Go online. Look up tattoo. You know what the first article comes is? In Wikipedia, because so many people use it. Or maybe they pay Amazon or uh, Google to come first. I don't know why, but it's first. And you go there, and if you look up tattoo, it's ordered, you know, it has all this gross stuff and a whole bunch of gross things, and then it has the history. You know what's fascinating? Judaism, no tattoos, because their God said not to do it. Christianity, hey, it's okay. But when Christianity entered different parts of the world, tattooing went way down. And it's talking about the history of Christian missions. So it's interesting that and then it says, in modern times, Christianity has no problem with tattoos, and it says probably half of all 30 and under people have them. It says where, and the article's fascinating, it says, whereas you used to have to go to a foreign port somewhere or some border town next to the pawn shop, you know, to go to the tattoo place, now it's mainstream, everyone is modifying their body. That's what the article says, modifying their body. I'll tell you a little story before I get to Romans 12. Bonnie and I rent a very nice home. Belongs to a very nice man. Spent a lot of money on it. If I wanted to remodel the bathroom and I rent that house, do you think I would remodel the bathroom without what? Asking the owner. Yet we have an entire generation that thinks I can modify this thing any way I want. It's mine. No. That's getting squeezed into the world's shape. The world says, you're the master of your body. Women's rights to kill the unborn life within them. It's all part of the same thing. It's your body. You can do anything you want with it. No, it's not if you're a believer. If you're not a believer, it's still God's body, and he's going he's to call you into judgment for every sin. But for every believer, our sins are forgiven, but we're going to be called into judgment for whether we did with our body what he asked us to do. And what did he ask us to do? Romans 12. I beseech you therefore, brethren, so he's only talking to Christians, by the mercy of God, the God that hasn't given you, what is mercy? God doesn't give us what we deserve. That's mercy. Grace, he gives us what we don't deserve. But mercy is he doesn't give us what we do deserve. God is so merciful, he's so patient, he doesn't swat us that you, because of the response of love for his great mercy wherewith he loved us, that you present your bodies back to him. Say, I'm just a renter. You're the owner. I want to modify this. Do you want me to modify it? See, you understand? The whole idea that, that your bodies are to be a living sacrifice, that means that my goal is not to modify it constantly so I look better or younger or augment it so I attract people. The idea is I want my body to be a living sacrifice for what reason? That is holy and acceptable to God, not squeezed by the culture. Very interesting how Christians have gotten squeezed into the mold. That it's okay to, to spend the majority of my time modifying my body so it is more appealing. To whom? 
We're supposed to be acceptable to God, not culture. Very interesting. It's our reasonable service. Now, we studied this when we got to Revelation 4. Reasonable, laiturgeo, has to do with us offering worship offerings to God. Remember, at the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to have our bodies analyzed by none other than Christ, the Creator Himself, whether our bodies were used for good or good for nothingness. Now, now I'm not going to go down this trail too far, but I want you to think about we can even be involved in worship ministry and lose all reward for that worship ministry if the container that God lives in that's used in the worship ministry is drawing the attention of the worshipers away from God and to the body. Did you know there's a lot, there are a lot of worship people that are involved in worship professionally that wouldn't be caught dead singing from behind a screen. How would you like if I sang from behind here and you couldn't even see me? Nobody would know who I am. You see, there has to be such visible worship that I fear, and this has nothing to do with this, so I'll get off that line, I fear there's a lot of people that do it for the show instead of the one that said not unto us O lord not unto us but but unto thy name be the glory be careful what you do with your body what he's saying make it a reasonable offering of worship and don't be conformed don't be squeezed into this world's shape but be transformed by renewing your mind how do we get our minds renewed by reasoning through the scripture so i already told you what my conviction is now i'm going to ask you about yours okay i simply don't tattoo because it says in leviticus 1928 i am the lord don't tattoo i don't need any greek or hebrew or ugaritic or any other concordance I don't need 17 theology books to tell me I'm under grace and that has no bearing on my life. The eternal, infinite God told people that he loved and said they were to be his kingdom of priests and a holy nation. He says, I am the Lord, don't mark your body. I say, okay. You know, in heaven, if you want to... By the way, God does tattoo us in heaven. I'm waiting for his. It says in Revelation 3, I'm going to write on you when you get here your new name that only you and I know. I'm going to write it on you. Isn't that interesting? But renew your mind through the word. Prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. That's what we're supposed to be doing all the way through life. All the way through life, we're supposed to be knowing what is God's good and perfect will. Second principle, the first principle, was the fact that God wants us kept from getting squeezed. The second principle is God owns my body. I'm not my own. We really need to harp on this, especially with this new generation that, that doesn't realize this. It is not my body. I can't put anything on it I want. Now, I can if I'm lost, but if I'm saved, I can't. This is God's body, and what I put on it, whether the clothing or the weight or the markings, reflect on the owner. Just like my rental house that I'm on, it reflects on the owner what I do. Did you know when we lived in Portage that there was this regulation about you had to mow and you have to, you have to blow the snow and there's a fine if you don't have your sidewalk cleared? And I can say, I don't care, it's, it doesn't belong to me. Yeah, but who gets fined? The owner. See, it's so important that we understand that we're owned. We're, we're, we are the possession of another. And so, God owns my body. I'm not my own. And look what the Lord says about that through his servant, the Apostle Paul, who is just the conduit, this is God's word, or do you not know your body? Do you see how much emphasis is on the body? We're going to give an account for our body, what we did in our body, what we did to our body, what we did with our body. So your body is the temple. Now, it's interesting, the word, there, there are two words for temple. Uh, there's hitaron, which just means a pile of rocks in a square, and there's naos, which speaks of the holy of holies. Did you know you and I are not only the visible representation, the hit around, but we are also the, the very holy of holies of God. And we are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God. And here it is again, you're not your own. So I can't just say I'm going to modify my body any way I want. It doesn't matter which modification we're talking about. 
There are a lot of other modifications nobody asked me about. What about these people that are resisting by every dime in their, that they have, resisting the onslaught of the fact that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God and we're all going to get old and die? I mean, it's amazing how hard some people try and stop that. Rather than say, hey, Psalm 92 says that the older I get, the more fruitful I can be. And maybe if I spend less of my time trying to look like I'm 32 years old and, and just look my age, that I could have a ministry. We're not on that topic either. I get off all the time. For you were bought at a price, the precious blood of Christ. Therefore, glorify God in your body. See, the, your body is a temple. You're not your own. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The body is the actual physical. The spirit is the attitude behind what I do. And God just as much doesn't like the, the wrong physical response as he does the wrong attitude of our hearts. And this attitude that I'm, you know, I can do whatever I want to do is ungodly. Independence is ungodly. Dependence on God is a reflection of his ownership and of our need of him. Well, the next principle, the principle of rewards. My rewards are all about what I do with this grace-taught body. You say, what do you mean grace-taught? Well, it's coming in a minute, but I want to introduce you to that. It says that the grace that saves us teaches us to deny ungodliness in any form. That's why tonight is not about undoing what we've done in the past. It's about going forward. What does God want us to do with our bodies? Forward. The more we understand that they belong to him. Well, my rewards, and by the way, earthly life is three score and ten, 70 years. If you're strong, four score. If you live in America, maybe a little bit longer. Or if you live in Japan, they live even longer. Or I forget, you know, some people are into their 120s. But sooner or later, we're going to have to stand before the Lord if we're a believer, and we're going to get rewarded for what I did with this body of his. That's what 2 Corinthians 5.10 tells us. And what it says is, for we must all phanerothenai appear before the judgment seat, bema, of Christ. Phanerothenai means to be made manifest to everyone. What's really interesting is the judgment seat of Christ is public. You know, people hide a lot of stuff. At the judgment seat of Christ, it's public. It's public record. And what's going to be shown is, how did I do with my body reflecting God's ownership? Very interesting thought. That each one, heskaton, that means one by one. It's not a group deal. It's not a global. You know how you can change you know, a whole bunch of things on the computer at once, do a global. No, it's singular. It's very personal. It's public in the sense everyone's watching. It's personal in the sense that he deals with us one by one. That's what each one means, one by one, in order. Receive, now look at this, the things done in the body. It's amazing to think about. I'm going to answer for where I took this temple, for what I put or didn't put on this temple, for what I did with this temple. Very interesting. According to what he has done, whether good or foul on, the word bad is not the word for bad like sin. It's bad like the word foul on, bad right here, is translated wisp, swirl, dust, like a little twister of dust. And, and so much of our life is not because all sin will be removed. Already has. The record of all sins was removed at the cross. But so much of our life, as, as um, I've said many times, is it sin to watch a three-hour football game? No. Is it sin to watch a three-hour football game if you've never spent time with the Lord who loved you and gave himself for you? Might be. Might be, because that would mean the football game had a higher spot, which is what an idol is, taking God's place. I'm glad it's not football season, so you know I'm not talking about anybody here, whether good or bad, right? I don't even know what season it is. I'm 
I'm sports challenged. It's, it's Olympic season, I know that. Okay, the next principle is the principle of holiness. God is holy, and he's told us avoid unclean things. It's incumbent upon us who are owned that we reflect the owner. And the owner says, I don't want any unclean things touching you. In fact, it says in Ephesians 5, I don't even want a hint. I don't want you even to joke about unclean things. I don't even want you to hint about it. That's what our humor has gotten to be. It's, it's, it's not overt, it's, it's coming around the side. It's innuendo. God said, I don't even want any innuendos about evil things. Not only do I not want you doing them, and I don't want you looking at them, I don't even want you hinting about them. I don't want even a hint of unclean things. Well, this is a neat passage. 2 Corinthians 6, 4, uh, or 14. Paul already started in the 10th verse and says, I'm opening my heart wide to you, Corinthians. But, but what he's doing is he's talking to this church about their challenge towards sanctification. They were sanctification challenged. If you know anything about Corinth, they had the Acro Corinthus, the high place of Corinth, which was a giant temple to Aphrodite, to the, the goddess of immorality. And so they had to live in immorality all the time, just around them. Uh, just, they were just reeking of, of the smoke of sin around them. And so it was, some of them were kind of getting you know, passive, you know how you can get, breathe somebody else's smoke and gives you cancer? They were, they were seeing all the sin around them and it was starting to infect them. So Paul says, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And then he gives a series of, of uh, little pairs. For what fellowship or partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Isn't it interesting with lawlessness? The absence of righteousness is lawlessness. And he says, you should not be that way. Um, and what communion has light with darkness? We're the light lost or darkness, and sin is darkness. What accord has Christ with foolishness, with Belial, with, with worthlessness? Don't, don't be involved with worthless, dark, lawless things. What part has a believer with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God, that's us, our our body with idols, representations of false gods. And he says, none. And then he starts in, in verse 16, for you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them. I will walk among them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Look at this. Do not touch what is unclean. Do not even come into contact. Paul earlier said, when it comes to evil, be like a child. Isn't it interesting? Well, it used to be this way. You could be around young people and you could talk about things and they didn't even know what you were talking about. They were, we used to call it innocent. And, and, and they just, they didn't even have any concept. There were words. I remember when there were a whole series of words that no child knew. I remember the, the first time the public arena was exposed to some of these words was during the whole Bill Clinton era, when, when it was talked about what he was doing publicly. Whether he was doing it or not doesn't matter. That it was talked about is horrific. That we came to the point where, where we could allow our minds to touch unclean things. And, and so we're supposed to be children with unrighteousness. We're not supposed to be experts on all kinds of sin. And what will happen if we do that? I will receive you. I will be a father to you. And you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. By the way, do you know when the very first time that word occurs in the whole Bible? I'm into the first times, and, and I want you to know it's fascinating. The first time Lord Almighty comes is in the life of Abraham. It's in chapter 17. We're going to talk about it, Lord willing, next Sunday. It is one of the most beautiful names of God. El Shaddai. Shaddai means the satisfier. It spoke of a baby being nursed. It, it spoke of, of, of something being nurtured. God says, I am the Lord, your satisfier. He says, why do you have to be satisfied by what's unclean? 
Why do you have to be satisfied by, by what I don't want you to touch? I am the Lord Almighty. I have the unlimited eternal power to satisfy you. That's why God said to David when he was involved in his adultery, he, said, he says, I would have given you anything you wanted. Why did you take what I told you you couldn't have? And that's how we're wired. And God says, grace gives you the strength you don't do the way you were wired. Verse 18, I'll be a father to you. You'll be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Verse 7, or chapter 7, verse 1. By the way, this is an example. Do you remember when uh, Robert Estienne, the printer, was, was marking off the chapter marks in the Bible so that they could print a copy of the Bible on the printing press? He was riding a horse because he was fleeing. And... Uh, and the horse must have hit a bump because he cut this chapter off right there. Actually, it ends right here. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. You see, a response is, is requested from God. And so God says, I don't want you around unclean stuff. And we have to speed up the principle of denial. Grace teaches me to deny ungodliness in any form it takes. For the grace of God that brought salvation, I was saved by grace, uh, has appeared to all men, and that grace that appears to us teaches us, and by the way, some say that that means Christ. Christ is the grace that brings salvation. Great. Then Christ teaches us, and it could be just the grace of God in general. But whichever, it's Christ or the grace, it teaches us something. Grace teaches us to deny ungodliness in any form. And worldly lusts. It was interesting. Again, if you read about tattoos online, you know what it says? Most people after 10 years wish they didn't have them because it harms their job interviews or they don't still love Susie. You know what I mean? And, uh, or whatever. And, and so then they have to go about to undo whatever it was they did. Uh, and so it's, it's interesting that, that this, this going along with the world even the world says you should be cautious. We should live soberly. You know what soberly means? It means we don't inhale the intoxicants. Again, Wikipedia says that there's just been a kind of like a societal surge of everybody wanting to modify their body. And people are modifying their body. They don't even want, know why they're modifying their body. It's just everybody's modifying. It's kind of like if we're going to remodel, I want to remodel too. I don't even know what I need to remodel, but I'm going to remodel something. And that's not being sober. Righteous means reflecting God. Godly, godlike in the present age. Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people. People that are, by the way, it's interesting. Paul said, my body's marked. I'm marked with the marks of Christ. Do you know what he was talking about? I bear my body, the marks of Christ. He was talking about his beatings. He says, I, I have a marking. Paul said that's, that's one example. Another time Paul says, though I give my body to be burned, he's not talking about a funeral pyre. He's not talking about being burned at the stake. That's the actual word for being branded as a slave. He says, he says I, I am Christ's slave. And he says, even if I allowed them to, to brand me as a slave and don't have love, it doesn't count as anything. So we're his special people. They're supposed to be zealous for good works. So we should be cautious that we're not squeezed into this by the world. Finally, the principle of separation. God hates the occult. Have nothing to do with the former ways of the devil. Uh, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Same thing. Don't get intoxicated. Rest your hope fully on the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Christ as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts. It's interesting, up until modern times, tattoos were for pirates. They were for sailors. They were for military guys that, you know, they weren't, they weren't mainstream by and large. They were for the daring, the people... But now that it's become mainstream, we should make sure as obedient children we're not conforming ourselves to something that was formerly representative of unwholesome lives. As in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, be holy in all your conduct. Now look at verse 16. Where do you think that comes from? That's Leviticus 19.2. Isn't that fascinating? 
that he cites the very section that has all those, I'm the Lord, I'm the Lord, I'm the Lord, I'm the Lord's, and says, you should be careful. Well, this is what Paul says we're going to live in. This is Paul looking to the last generation. The last days, perilous times are come. Men will be lovers of themselves. We're just thinking about how they can love themselves more. Loving money. Look at what we've gotten into because of greed. Even the, the London interbank loan rate scandal going on, the Libra rate, where, where they were manipulating interest rates at the highest level. Lovers of money. Boasters. Social media has brought out the boasting. Proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Unbelievable where we've gotten these days. Unthankful. I mean, there's just no gratitude hardly for anything. It's almost like we deserve everything. Unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, with no self-control, brutal. Sounds like we're reading the newspaper, doesn't it? Despisers of good. This is the Chick-fil-A thing, despising good. You try and be uphold God's standard, we'll despise you right out of our town. We live in this time. Traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Amazing. Amazing. The church is having to alter their schedule. Remember, we went back to, we were talking about the Sabbath day that love demands intimacy and that we're supposed to set aside in the blur of lifetime to be intimate with God. And yet, Christians have such a lover of pleasure that we have to cut back the number of services because, you know, it's just very hard to do everything I want to do and go to church all the time. That's part of the end, that there, there, is, there isn't such a deep love of God anymore that causes us to do anything to be with his body and his family, his people, and worship. Having a form of godliness but denying its power, it's kind of the impotence of of the last day's church, from such people turn away. So that's Paul's perilous time. Now I just want to read you real quickly. This is fascinating to me. This was a two-year-ago blog that my uh, friend and pastor, John MacArthur, you know, he blogs. I doubt if he does. He doesn't even use a computer. But, I, you know, somebody took his words and put it online. And this is what he wrote two years ago. Take a moment and walk with the average young person to see what they might encounter during a typical day. As they visit the internet homepage, their eyes are assaulted with images of half-dressed celebrities parading the sin of an independent, immoral lifestyle. The DJ from the local radio station will accompany him on his way to school. It's usually someone with a crass sense of humor filling his mind with contemporary lyrics that promote the way that the book of Proverbs would call folly. Along the road, they're exposed to billboards and advertisings designed to arouse their lust and create discontentment. At any time he spends with the world's entertainment, it will portray a very realistic form of make-believe. A very realistic, so there's a blur, you don't know what's real anymore. The typical television programs and movies glorify the mysterious and exhilarating life of the rebel. That's what our media does. He is defiant, witty, violent, sexual, rich, and playful, utterly godless, but never mind the consequences. That's just an assessment of modern-day entertainment. Get the picture? Before many teenagers arrive at school, their minds are already pondering the messages and the images they've seen and the voices they've heard, and that's before eight or more hours of teachers and peer influence. It's a daily exercise in mind pollution. Remember I've told you that parents will do anything to sterilize the spoon that goes in their child's mouth, but they let the sewer flow through their mind? And, and the mouth will only hurt their stomach, the mind will hurt their soul and corrode it. It's no secret that our age in particular has turned, to defi has turned defiance into a virtue and made obedience something to be mocked. Chick-fil-A is a good example. Obedience to God's word? Mock it. This warped and rebellious worldview comes through in every aspect of popular culture. So many of the sitcoms are nothing but endless sarcasm. And those that endlessly watch sarcasm, do you know what sarcasm means? It means hooks in the flesh. Words that put hooks in flesh. And, and when you're entertained by sarcastic, cutting, hooks in flesh comments, you become sarcastic, caustic, cutting. Entertainment, music, and even newscasts glorify revolt and rebellion against every form of authority. Statistics show the average child living at home in America watches at least 28 hours of television each week. Boy, if that's true, they could read the whole Bible through once a month. I used to do that. It takes 78 hours. The average child could read the Bible through every month if they didn't watch this onslaught of mind pollution. 
For some kids, the total is much higher. Programming that targets young people is often the very worst at deliberately glamorizing sin. By the time most teenagers graduate from high school, they've been overexposed to the grossest kinds of evil through entertainment media in mind-numbing ways so that nothing shocks them. Nothing is appalling to them. Have you thought about where we've gotten to? You can watch, you know, the, the new uh, princess of Wales, whatever her name is, you know, doing something noble, and then you can watch splat someone being killed. And then you can go back to, you know, some touching thing and go splat to another, and it's just nothing, we're numbed. It's just all images, and it's just, it's just all not appalling anymore. What's the predictable result? Drug abuse, violent crimes, sexual promiscuity, other forms of lawlessness are at epidemic levels among teenagers. In fact, I was just last week invited to speak uh, to the group that has the highest suicide rate in the world, and it's not very far from here. The highest suicide rate right now in the world is in Quebec. The French-speaking Canadians have now captured for the last two years the highest suicide rate. Why? Because epidemic levels of violence, sin, Large, disturbing subcultures are starting to exist among young people who practice bizarre forms of body man modification, tattooing and piercing. They immerse themselves in occultism or they openly practice other forms of antisocial behavior. Most young people have trouble knowing how to relate to people because they're so electronica. Sin and rebellion have taken society captive. Tragic effects are most vividly apparent in the culture of our young people. Yet millions in society, especially among those in control of the entertainment and media, glory in the evil. And there's 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. Well, real quickly, it's time to go. Whenever we have a gray area of life, we must revert to the doctrines about how to handle. In other words, if you don't think Leviticus 19, 28 has anything to do with you, then Romans 14 and 15 talks about what to do. In Christ, we're under the law of liberty. In Christ, we're under the law of love. And in Christ, we're to bear each other's burdens. And so we have to, because of the law of liberty, decide what to do. And so in questionable things, is this activity one that profits me for eternity or just a moment? Will the Lord say, I'm so glad you modified your body? Is it expedient for eternity? Will it edify? Will this activity strengthen or weaken my spiritual life? Will I be built up and matured? And, and if you can answer yes, then under the law of liberty, as long as you're not any longer under the authority of your parents that you have to obey them living at home, then you can do whatever matches this criteria of the law of liberty in Christ. Exaltation. Will this activity clearly describe uh, as a pathway to magnify God? Will the Lord be lifted up and glorified in what I do? You know, tattooing some part of my body that no one should see anyway, except your husband or wife, you know? Uh, evangelism, will this activity increase my evangelistic ability or decrease it? Will, will I be an example? Will others seek to follow my example, be helped or hindered? Is this activity a weight that can trip me up, that needs to be laid aside? Is it necessary? Or is it really not that important? And finally, is this an activity, something that Jesus would do or not do? You know, it's interesting. It's interesting to think about what Christ would do. Does God's word guide us about having tattoos? My personal conviction is because I'm the temple of God and because God plainly says in Leviticus 19.28 to not tattoo his temple by his grace because I love him, I won't. But each of us are supposed to have our own convictions based on the word of God. And it's 7.17, so let's all stand because they turn the lights out here at 7.15. You know, we're, I'm teasing. And, uh, and that's my conviction about tattoos. And you can arrive at your own from the Word of God. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Thank you, dear Father, that we're not our own, that every one of us here who've been purchased with the precious blood of Jesus Christ belong to new master, we're just renting. And we can't modify this temple. Whether or not Leviticus 19.28 has anything to do with us, we can't modify this temple unless we speak to the owner. 
unless we really know your mind and whether you are exalted by my modification. So I pray that everybody of every age would decide that whether therefore they eat or drink or modify their body, they would do it only for the glory of God. Because we're going to give an account for the things done in our bodies. And because we love you, we want to only do that which pleases you with our bodies. Thank you. And we pray for your wisdom from above as we seek to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present very evil world. And in the name of Jesus Christ we pray and all of God's people said, Amen. God bless you as you go.